You are watching original video by truthdig.com. For more information and resources, visit us on the web at www.truthdig.com. We all know who Chris Hedges is. That's why you're here. Uh, big draw. I just want to say a few things. Uh, I, I worked at the LA Times for 30 years, and uh, so I know something about mainstream journalism, and I have a particular respect for Chris Hedges coming out of that environment, trying to work in these institutions, trying to maintain your integrity, and up against everything from insufferable arrogance, bureaucracy, and, uh, and timidity, and opportunism. And uh, it, it's really sort of been interesting to switch roles and be the editor of Truth Dig and have this uh, star journalist uh, leading our site. This week, uh, for example, his column uh, uh, pulled, I believe, 90,000 readers. Uh, that's pretty big. And not all that, but of course, it's stolen by every other site, so it's probably been about 10 million readers. And I'm in this position where I realize that I have put editors in, you know, uh, where people ask me to explain Chris Hedges. And, uh, you know, uh, why such a strong view? Why sometimes such a dark view? Uh, you know, why not more cheerful? And uh, so I, I, I've never been in this position before, you know. Usually other people had to explain me. And, uh, and then I always go back and reread uh, these columns. And I realize what is at work here. And he hates it when you say that he's the prophetic voice. And he knows a lot about religion, and I know nothing about religion. So maybe it means something terrible. Uh, but I know what it means to me. And that at any time in a, in a society, in a civilization, there are things that have to be said, and they're not said. They're not said because people are going along. They're afraid. Uh, they want to be trendy, they don't want to startle people, and they don't want to take the, the punishment. And every time I read one of these Chris Hedges columns that some neighbor or someone at the university or someone else uh, tells me is too dark, I read it and I say, no, the problem is, unfortunately, it's accurate. Unfortunately, unfortunately. And that's not Chris is doing. That's not his doing. And so I think we are honored tonight, frankly, to have the outstanding, most outstanding journalist, indeed, at least in our country, if not in the world. I don't want to be culturally arrogant and assume I know all those other folks out there. But I just can't think of anyone that I read with greater respect uh, and more honored to be associated with than Chris Hedges. So please come up. Well, that's embarrassing. Um, well, the only reason I wrote and agreed to write for Truth Dig is because of Bob. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, you can go all the way back to Ramparts and uh, all the way up to him being thrown out of the Los Angeles Times because he took a stand very, very few people in the mainstream press would take uh, against uh, the war in Iraq, uh, and I think right about the same time we both lost our jobs uh, for the same reason. Uh, and for me, great journalism is not about news. Uh, any journalist will tell you that we can take the same set of facts and spin the story any way we want. Journalists manipulate facts. Great journalists care about truth. And in the same way that great preachers care about truth. And that's why those journalists who do exist within institutions like the New York Times or the Los Angeles Times are such management problems. Um, because they will just hammer away and hammer away and hammer away, often at the expense of their own career. Um, Sidney Shanberg is a good example. He comes back from Cambodia from covering uh, the rise of the Khmer Rouge. He's put on the city desk. He sees how developers are driving 
the working and the middle class out of Manhattan, uh, and and he starts uh, writing about it. And of course, these are the people who have lunch and socialize with the publisher. And he won't let go, and he won't let go, and he won't let go until it, what happens at the New York Times. It's a bit like the old Communist Party in the Soviet Union. They never tell you what you've done wrong. You just suddenly find out that you're the deputy party chief in Tajikistan. Um, <clears throat> and, and that's what happened to me at the end of my career. Um, and it's, that's what's happened to Sidney, which he left, of course. Um, that, that's, I think, you know, inevitably when you uh, care about the truth, uh, you are going to confront the institutions that you work for. There's a great theologian, Paul Tillich, who says all institutions, including the church, are inherently demonic. And Bob spoke about my father, who was, uh, after 40 years, as a parish minister driven out of the Presbyterian church for his stance on gay rights. His brother was gay, my uncle, and my father had a particular sensitivity to the pain of being a gay man in America in the 1950s and the 1960s. And, uh, um, and he did set the model for which I live my own life. <clears throat> and I always tell the story about when I was booed off of a commencement stage in Rockford, Illinois, at Rockford College uh, for denouncing the war. Uh, and then that got, I mean, Bob and I were lynched in exactly the same way, in the same way that Ralph Nader was lynched, in the same way that Jeremiah Wright was lynched, where they, they take a certain soundbite and they loop it. And in my case, it was four days long on Fox and on O'Reilly. And, uh, um, uh, and the Times was pressured to respond. And I, um, uh, you know, I remember going into the, and, it, and you know, you're losing your job is not, and I was, I knew that, you know, at this point, uh, losing the job would mean that I wasn't going to get a job at another mainstream uh, news organization. Uh, but I, uh, you know, confronting that, the institution, where they gave me a formal written reprimand, which under guild rules means that you, uh, uh, you have violated in what they call the ethics policy, kind of irony in that, um, for speaking out against the war, uh, and that I, I uh, was, I, I had been given that written reprimand, and if I spoke out again, I would lose my job. That, uh, that's guild rules. <clears throat> and I think finally, you know, the greatest gift my father gave me was, in essence, freedom, um, because I didn't need the New York Times to tell me who I was. I didn't need any institution to tell me who I was. My father had taught me who I was. And I remember when my dad lost his own job, um, the, he was uh, publicly advocating gender equality rights uh, at a time when the Presbyterian Church was deeply hostile. And I think although he was involved in the anti-war movement, and he'd a World War II vet, he'd been a sergeant in North Africa in the Civil Rights Movement, I think it was the gay rights movement the church found most unpalatable. And um, he, rather than back down, this is where I get, I suppose, this characteristic from, uh, he decided that uh, uh, one Easter he was going to publicly, he had a church in Syracuse, hold a citywide Easter service for gays and lesbians. And um, he, I was at Colgate, uh, and he drove down and picked me up because he said it'd probably be one of the last times I heard him preach, which turned out to be the case. And he got up and he said, uh, Marriage is not a reward for being a heterosexual. Marriage is a sacrament. And any church that refuses to honor the sacrament of marriage does not deserve to call itself Christian. This video program was brought to you by truthdig.com. For more information and resources, visit us on the web at www.truthdig.com.